Our presenter this afternoon, our topic is the skin and movement disorders from diagnostic to therapeutic aspect, aspects, pardon me, by Dr. Skorvanek. Dr. Skorvanek is a university professor and current chair of the Movement Disorders Unit and Center for Rare Movement Disorders at the Safrik University in Koswick, Slovakia. He is currently the associate he is also the current chair of the Slovak Movement Disorder Society. He did his PhD at the University of Groningen, Netherlands, and did a, move, a movement disorder fellowship also at UCLA Queen Squares in London, the UK, and Charles University in Prague, Chetnia. His main research interests include genetic aspects of Parkinsonism and hyperkinetic movement disorders, as well as biomarkers of prodromal Parkinson's disease. He currently leads several projects and cohorts in this area. He is the past chair of the MDS ES Education Committee. Thank you very much. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Skorvanek. Hello, thank you very much. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here today uh, for several reasons. Uh, first, uh, as I wrote to someone in the email, I always like to interact with patients. That That's always very nice, but I have also a family connection to Alberta because my uncle lives in Calgary, my cousin, so I've, I visited several times, and I'm really glad that we can um, have to spend this one hour together today. So my talk will be dedicated to the problem of... Uh, skin and Parkinson's disease. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. All right, so, so these are some pictures from my city at home in Slovakia. Really nice place. And uh, what I will be talking about mostly today is the problem of skin and Parkinson's disease, which is uh, a slightly neglected area of, of non-motor aspects of Parkinson's disease. And I will cover this from two, uh, two aspects. Uh, one will be the diagnostic aspect related to skin and everything that is about skin and Parkinson's disease. And the other one related to therapies. So uh, before going actually to the skin itself, just a brief introduction on the diagnostic and uh, I mean the diagnostic uh, area or the diagnostic uh, uh, um, the diagnostic uh, uh, approach we have to Parkinson's disease now. So we know that Parkinson's disease doesn't start when the first motor symptoms occur within the disease. So that's our point zero here, the diagnosis. Patients start moving slow, they are a bit rigid, start having a resting tremor, et cetera, et cetera. But in fact, the disease goes on for a number of years before that. We can see it in this picture. So this uh, line represents loss of dopaminergic neurons in the brain. So we need a certain amount of loss before we can actually start seeing the motor symptoms in patients. But what we typically see already years before the typical motor symptoms are some non-specific uh, non-motor symptoms like hyposmia, constipation, some sleep disorders, et cetera, et cetera. And where we would actually like to get, and this is basically the holy grail of today's research, is to make the diagnosis somewhere here, years before the motor symptoms of disease actually start manifesting. And uh, this would give us a much bigger window of opportunity to make a meaningful uh, neuroprotective or disease modifying intervention to the disease. So right now where we are, uh, these are the, these, this is the core criterion in diagnosing Parkinson's disease. So all patients now who get a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease clinically established must present with bradykinesia. That means slow movement. If I see a patient who has some sort of Parkinsonism in my clinic, then my second question is whether this is classic Parkinson's disease or whether this is atypical or some other sort of Parkinsonism like multiple system atrophy, dementia with Lewy bodies, or some vascular Parkinsonism, drug-induced Parkinsonism, etc. And we have certain clinical clues that would tell these uh, two uh, groups apart. 
Parkinson's disease will constitute about 80% of all cases with Parkinsonism. And uh, of course, having Parkinson's disease is the classic one, is the probably the best option of all the bad options because Parkinson's disease is a disease which we can uh, symptomatically manage for a number of years. And as I will show you, there are some skin changes which may also point us towards the um, diagnosis of Parkinson's disease compared to the other Parkinsonian disorders. Another aspect which is very important in terms of diagnostics of Parkinson's disease, and it's uh, partially connected also to skin, is um, the alpha-synuclein pathology. We know that all neurodegenerative disorders, as we understand them today, uh, come with some abnormal accumulation of a certain protein in the brain and or the peripheral nervous system. So in Parkinson's disease, this protein or this pathological protein that is accumulating is called alpha-synuclein. This is a normal protein that every one of us has in our uh, body, in our cells, as a normal physiological function in a synaptic transmission. But under certain circumstances, uh, this normal molecule or this normal protein changes its conformation. That means changes the shape of the protein. So the, the protein is the same. It just changes the shape. And since, it's, since uh, it changes the shape, it starts becoming sticky and forms oligomers and then amyloid fibrils, which uh, in a way damage cells and can be transmitted within our nervous system. Uh, we think this is one of the key players in the pathophysiology of Parkinson's disease, but there is still a large debate going on about uh, the exact mechanisms, how this uh, protein uh, or what kind of role it plays in the pathophysiology, in the etiology of the disease. Nevertheless, we have some diagnostic uh, use of this protein, and I will show you where we are with the diagnostic aspects in terms of the skin right now. And uh, closing the introduction or nearing uh, to the to, to the end of my introduction part, uh, as I told you, before the onset of motor symptoms, which is here, that's year zero, we have a number of symptoms that may start years before uh, the first motor or the clear motor signs are present. And we have uh, symptoms like hyposmia, some sleep problems, but we have also a big group of autonomic dysfunction, uh, problems like erectile dysfunction, constipation, some urinary problems. And although we do not see any skin-related uh, problems on this slide, there are certain features which may present years before uh, the onset of motor symptoms, like uh, sweating disturbances, uh, but they are still not included in the major uh, major diagnostic criteria because we do not have, I mean, the, the, the volume of research on skin problems in Parkinson's disease is rather small, and we do not have uh, big studies that would allow us to uh, include these skin-related problems in the formal diagnostic criteria we have right now. Uh, so moving uh, into the earlier stages of Parkinson's disease. So we have now clinical diagnostic criteria for Parkinson's disease as such, but we have also research criteria for prodromal Parkinson's disease. So this is the stage, this is the very early or the earliest stage of disease when patients still do not manifest the motor symptoms. And we have a rather complicated way of identifying patients already at this stage. And uh, in, uh, in, in this process, we look at a number of risk and prodromal markers, which in combination tell us that this patient who has a certain likelihood ratio based on combining a combination of these symptoms has an 80% probability to develop fully uh, manifest Parkinson's disease in the next 10 years or so. So we have certain risk factors like male uh, sex, uh, exposures to some pesticide solvents, non-use of coffee, non-smoking, family history of, of Parkinsonism, diabetes, physical inactivity, low plasma urate levels in men, 
And then we have some symptoms already of the disease. So we have uh, REM sleep behavior disorder, which is probably the most specific prodromal feature of Parkinson's disease. But we have a number of others like uh, hyposmia or olfactory loss, constipation, etc., etc. As you can see, there is a number of features that we can have a look at in our patients, uh, but still no skin problems. Uh, and again, this is mostly because we do not have good studies and uh, solid data that we could uh, support um, for this um, case. Okay, so going to some specific skin conditions which are related to Parkinson's disease. Probably the best known uh, by far is seboroid dermatitis, which is a chronic relapsing dermatitis. Usually it affects um, the sebum rich areas of the head, scalp, hair, upper chest, face, ears, etc. This condition is generally more common either in infants or later on in life in people who are older than 50 years old, and it's uh, slightly more common in men. We know that this condition is clearly more common in Parkinson's patients uh, compared to general population, and we know that in some patients, seboroid dermatitis may present very early in the disease, already in the prodromal stages. The etiology is not absolutely clear, but there is uh, some association with uh, malassezia yeast. And uh, we know there are some, uh, some associations also with certain uh, polymorphisms, genetic polymorphisms, so genetic changes related to Parkinson's disease, which play a role in lipids metabolism. Uh, management of this condition uh, is in the hands of dermatologists. So my most, uh, my, my biggest disclosure here is that I'm a neurologist, a uh, movement disorder specialist, so uh, I may not be able to answer all your uh, therapeutic aspects uh, in the discussion later on, but uh, uh, I will do my best. But uh, this is basically what we know from the literature, what we know from clinical experience uh, that may help. Anyhow, uh, in case of major problem, uh, a dermatologist is the person to uh, contact with, with these problems. The second uh, skin problem, which is clearly more common in Parkinson's disease compared to general population, is rosacea. Uh, here you can see a lady with these reddish changes in her cheeks. This is again a chronic inflammatory disorder. Uh, the etiology actually is not very well understood in general. There are different factors which may um, play a role in, in occurrence of rosacea. Uh, the management, again, uh, in the hands of a dermatologist. What you can do as patients uh, is avoid triggering factors. These include, for example, very spicy foods, uh, alcohol, uh, certain types of uh, uh, food, hot beverage, excessive uh, exercise, etc. Uh, the remaining uh, therapeutic options, again, as I told, are in the hands of dermatologists and will largely depend on the severity of the problem. Uh, the third uh, quite specific problem, which may be related to Parkinson's disease is the so-called bullous pemphigoid, which is a autoimmune blistering condition, like you can see here in the slide. Uh, this is a condition which is uh, associated not only to Parkinson's disease, but generally also to other neurological conditions like Alzheimer's and some others. Uh, again, this is a condition which is clearly more common in Parkinson's disease compared to the general population. Usually uh, in bullous pemphigoid, what patients experience first is some itchy reddish patches on the skin. Then in these parts, uh, these uh, blisters start forming. They can be either clear or a bit reddish hemorrhagic. And when they rupture, they may lead erosions like here in the, in, in the second erosions and crusts. And uh, this is an autoimmune disease associated with a specific antibodies. And if this condition occurs, usually it requires um, systemic corticosteroid therapy, which is the treatment of choice. And um, to avoid bacterial superinfection, uh, 
all these erosions, local antiseptics or, or uh, antibiotics should be used. Uh, another skin problem, which is not a primary condition, but the consequence of, of another symptom of Parkinson's disease, maybe derma perioral dermatitis as a consequence of uh, saliva drooling. In some patients, this may be a major problem, like in this gentleman in the slide. And uh, this seems to be more related to reduced swallowing than increased saliva production. So our approaches, uh, we have two main therapeutic approaches in this regard. One approach would be to reduce saliva production. The other one would be to improve frequency and quality of swallowing. So improving frequency and quality of swallowing uh, goes uh, or is managed primarily by speech therapists. And some of them are really good in managing these problems um, in terms of what we can do as neurologists, uh, based on evidence from literature, by far the most effective uh, therapeutic option is botulinum toxin injection in the uh, salivary glands. Uh, we have three major salivary glands. Two of them um, enable continuous saliva production. One of them uh, produces saliva only during eating. So this is an on-demand production of saliva. So what we do uh, is we inject the two salivary glands, which uh, are responsible for continuous saliva production, but we do not inject the saliv salivary gland, which is responsible for saliva production during eating. So basically we reduce the overall uh, salivation outside of food, but the patient has enough saliva during eating. So this is a very effective and very um, basically safe procedure. Uh, one of the very common uh, problems is our sweating disturbances and patients with Parkinson's may experience both increased sweating, so hyperhidrosis, but they can experience also hypohidrosis. So that means decreased sweating. And uh, the data from literature are crazy uh, different in different papers. So uh, surprisingly, there are papers reporting uh, 9%, but papers reporting up to 100% of patients experiencing uh, some hyperhidrosis, uh, 9 to 46% for hypohidrosis. This occurs mostly in the head, neck, and trunk, so the axial, the mid, middle part of the body. In many patients, it may be quite asymmetric, and usually it tends to be more common in uh, patients who have young onset of Parkinson's disease. Uh, in terms of the factors which drive um, sweating disturbances, especially hyperhidrosis, uh, Typically, it is connection to dysfunction of autonomic nervous system. So the, the nervous system, which is innervating the uh, sweat glands. In terms of Parkinson's disease, we see mostly the sweating disturbances in patients uh, during their off state. Sometimes these may be an extreme drenching sweats uh, state or in patients uh, who experience dyskinesia where we think that this is related mostly to increased uh, energy expenditure uh, leading to increased sweating. Uh, what to do with this? Uh, I mean, there are, uh, there are different ways how to approach uh, sweating disturbances, especially hyperhidrosis, which for most patients, uh, is a bigger uh, problem than hypohidrosis. Uh, first of all, I try to analyze when and why my patients are sweating. So if sweating is related to off states, I try to uh, try and sort of smooth out the motor fluctuations. If my patients is generally underdosed, I try, I tend to increase his medication, either increase dopamine agonists or increase levodopa or add a COMT inhibitor. So making my patient uh, or achieving a good on state for as big part of the day as possible usually is very helpful. Uh, if patients have some focal uh, sweating problems like uh, increased sweating in the axillary regions or some specific parts of the body, 
Uh, we can use intradermal botulinum toxin injections. And in some patients, uh, uh, DBS may improve excessive sweating. Also, there are other cases where it will make no change at all. The last problem uh, where we get a lot of questions from patients, at least in my practice, is, is the connection with malignant melanoma. We know that patients with Parkinson's disease in general have a decreased uh, prevalence or occurrence of oncological disorders in general. So for nearly all oncological or cancer types, Parkinson's disease have lower prevalence. The exception is malignant melanoma, which is one of the very few uh, tumors which is more common in Parkinson's disease uh, compared to general population. Uh, although the cause of relationship is not clear, uh, melanocytes, which are the cells uh, uh, in the in the moles, uh, have the same origin as neurons. So we think uh, this is this may be one of the connections. Uh, but there seems not to be uh, a clear relationship to dopaminergic therapy, including levodopa. And also there may be some phobia to use uh, dopamine agonists or L-dopa in patients with malignant melanoma. We do not have any clear evidence from the literature uh, that using levodopa would increase the chance of having malignant melanoma or that would worsen uh, already existing malignant melanoma or lead to a recurrence. Uh, how to spot a malignant melanoma or where, when to increase your uh, awareness and see a dermatologist, we have the A, B, C, D, E criteria. So you, as, as you can see in the pictures here, so malignant melanomas may be asymmetrical. So the two halves of the mole do not look the same. The border usually is very irregular, blurred or jacked. The color is uneven. Usually they are bigger. So most of the malignant melanomas will have at least six millimeters in diameter. Although this is not a rule in all patients. And the last criterion is evolution. So the mole is changing in sh shape or size or color, etc. Usually it's the ugly duckling. It looks completely different from all the other moles. If we go to the atypical Parkinsonisms, so to neurodegenerative conditions other than Parkinson's disease, we have very, very limited information from the literature. What we know, patients with multiple system atrophy, uh, many of them will present with anhydrosis, so that means decreased sweating. And many of these patients will have very cold distal extremities, so we call this the cold hand sign. In patients who have dementia with Lewy bodies and progressive supranuclear palsy, there are basically no papers in the literature on skin at all. Uh, so moving from the clinical to the biological aspects of skin and uh, diagnosis of PD. Um, so this is more or less an outline of how we look at diagnostics of Parkinson's disease. Uh, right now, we are at the stage of clinical criteria, both for uh, motor stage of Parkinson's disease, but also for the prodromal stage of Parkinson's disease. This, of course, has some challenges. And where we are clearly going in the future, and I think uh, uh, there is no doubt that we will get there in a couple of years, is moving from a clinical diagnosis to a biological diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. I, I think the next uh, lecture today will be on biomarkers, so, so I, I'm sure you will hear more about that. Uh, the connection with skin is that the protein, the abnormal protein alpha-synuclein, is not present only in the brain of Parkinson's disease patients, but it is present, now what we know, it is present also in the peripheral nervous system, including skin fibers in the skin. And this is something that we can leverage uh, for, uh, for diagnostic purposes, uh, not only in the uh, symptomatic motor stage, but already early on in the disease, and do a skin biopsy to detect presence of alpha-synuclein in the nerve fibers um, there. There are different techniques how we can do that. Uh, historically, the most used technique is the so-called immunohistochemistry, 
where we do a classic biopsy. We use different antibodies to stain the molecule, which I want. In this case, it will be different forms of uh, alpha synuclein and uh, show that we can find accumulation of this abnormal protein in the structures uh, of the skin. So in this case, this would be a nerve, this would be a vessel, this there would there, it could be in a smooth muscle, etc. Uh, the good thing is that what we know now is that we can detect alpha synuclein not only in the motor stages, but also in the prodromal stages. What we have challenges with is which type of antibody to use in terms in order to increase the sensitivity and specificity of our investigations. So this is something that is ongoing for a couple of years. And although uh, there are some challenges, uh, we know that this is a method which can clearly help us in differentiating patients early on in terms of biology of the disease. But what is even more promising is uh, the so-called alpha-synuclein seeding assay. Uh, so this is a method which has been developed a couple of years ago to detect so-called prion diseases like Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. So we take some sample from the body and we can actually use nearly anything. It can be skin, it can be uh, cerebrospinal fluid, blood, saliva, uh, brain, olfactory mucosa, basically whatever. And we put this liquid or uh, tissue uh, into, into a medium where we have a monomer of the protein which we want to detect. And the tissue or the fluid contains so-called seed. So uh, seed in this case would be the pathological synuclein. Uh, what happens in this uh, method is that the seed connects with the monomer and basically replicates what we see in the disease. So from a small seed, we get a growing filament of the pathological protein that we can easily detect. So this method, uh, to simplify, enables us to detect something that is present in such minimal uh, volume that we cannot see it, for example, in immunohistochemistry, for example. And we can detect it very specifically. And what we can uh, differentiate even now is different types of fibrils. So we have different fibrils of alpha-synuclein in Parkinson's disease. We have different fibrils of alpha-synuclein in multiple system atrophy. So it enables us, or it can enable us, to detect the disease as such, the presence of synuclein, and it could potentially help us also differentiate between different diseases where synuclein is being uh, accumulated. What we know now in terms of diagnostic aspects is that this is a very sensitive and specific method. The diagnostic accuracy in prodromal stages in one of the papers was more than 80%, which is wonderful. In another uh, systematic review, compared to immunohistochemistry methods, uh, this alpha-synuclein seeding assay seemed to be more accurate both in the early and motor stages. And uh, what is quite nice is that um, skin biopsy uh, results were even more sensitive in another paper than cerebrospinal fluid and olfactory mucosa. So uh, this, this alpha-synuclein seeding assays seem to be a game changer in the diagnostic process. And I'm sure we'll hear a lot about that in the years to come. Now, moving from the uh, diagnostic to therapeutic aspects, uh, we have a number of skin uh, reactions or side effects of medications that I will go through now and uh, we can discuss also a bit uh, the management options. So first of all, uh, in levodopa, carbidopa or levodopa benzerazide therapy, by far the most common reaction we see are lower extremity edemas. Some patients may uh, develop allergic cutaneous reactions. These are definitely the two most common things we see in clinical practice. Uh, very infrequently, patients uh, may develop alopecia. I think I've seen only two patients in my life where I was convinced that this is somehow connected 
with levodopa therapy and some other relatively very rare uh, conditions. Uh, what we tend to do um, is either decrease the dose of levodopa and try to increase the other med uh, dopaminergic medications or initiate other options like apomorphine pump therapy or DBS if, if other uh, options are not possible. But as we know, levodopa is the uh, major uh, and most important drug in Parkinson's disease. So in many cases, we have to manage somehow uh, with the medication. Uh, for amantadine, which is the uh, which is another uh, medication which we use quite commonly, uh, probably the most severe and uh, but very rare complication which may occur is reticularis. So this is here in the picture. It looks like a fisherman nest, uh, bluish, reddish, purple uh, net structure in the legs. In this case, if, if something like this occurs, amantadine has to be discontinued, and usually this livedo reticularis uh, resolves in, in a matter of few weeks. Uh, in case of COMT inhibitors and entacapone, uh, opicapone or uh, tolcapone, very infrequently, some bolus eruptions may occur, but uh, I'm not sure I have uh, ever seen one in my clinical practice so far. So this is this is actually very, very rare. What is more common are uh, skin reactions uh, related to dopamine agonists. Uh, I'm not sure which ones you have available uh, in Canada, but uh, in terms of the most commonly used non-ergoline dopamine agonists uh, like ropinirol and pramipexol, by far the most common, again, um, similar to levodopa, would be lower limb edemas. Uh, in case this is connected to uh, initiation of therapy, usually uh, I consider uh, that there is a connection and I will either uh, decrease or discontinue or change to a different dopamine agonist. Uh, however, if limp edemas occur uh, years after I started my dopamine agonist therapy, I would not consider that this is a direct side effect and I will very hard look for other problems that may lead to limb edemas like cardiac problems, uh, renal problems, uh, protein uh, problems, etc., etc. In terms of rotigotin patches, uh, so again, a non-ergoline dopamine agonist I like very much. Uh, what we can see uh, mostly are localized skin reactions like erythema, uh, pruritus, some edema, etc., uh, blisters. Um, what patients should be doing, and I think this is the instruction in the patient leaflets as well, uh, is rotate uh, the site of uh, application. There is a scheme for about 14 day uh, rotation around the body. Um, sometimes if you put down the patch and the, the skin may be a little reddish, but it's not really, um, th there is not really a lot of pruritus and uh, the red patch um, goes away within a few hours of one day. Uh, it's it's no, uh, there is no need for some specific concerns. Nevertheless, if this is really bothersome, uh, itchy and there are some blisters. Of course, this is something uh, when the rotigotin patch should be discontinued. For the older ergoline uh, dopamine agonists, uh, I think in most countries in Europe, they are not used anymore. I'm not sure about Canada, so I will not go uh, into uh, much details here. Going to the advanced therapies, the first one to mention is apomorphine pump therapy. So this is a subcutaneous uh, therapy uh, where we inject a small needle in the abdominal uh, subcutaneous tissue. So usually patients uh, inject uh, the needle in the morning, the pump is on for the whole day and uh, they discontinue for, for the night. Uh, what we can see in some patients are skin nodules. Um, and this is seen more in uh, skinny people. Uh, so body weight is one of the risk factors for sure, a low weight especially. 
But there are some measures uh, which can be used to either decrease or uh, decrease the chance of uh, for nodule formation or decrease the chance of these nodules uh, getting infected. Uh, so it's very important to rotate the infusion sites. If possible, in some countries, it, it's possible to use Teflon needles, which uh, have a lower uh, probability of inducing the nodules. Uh, adjust the injection angle. It's very important to maintain skin hygiene. Uh, for the doctors, uh, if something like this happens, we tend to use lower concentrations. Uh, so low concentrations uh, sometimes may decrease the formation of new nodules. For US patients, uh, it's always very important to massage the infusion site. So when I take the needle out, I would massage with a, a tennis ball or a spiky rubber massage ball or something for like five minutes uh, Another option is to apply ultrasound treatment and use some silicone gel dressings. Uh, nowadays, uh, apomorphine pump is a, a very well-known therapeutic option. We have this available for a number of years, actually decades. What should be available soon uh, is a subcutaneous pump with FOS levodopa. Uh, and this will be probably another game changer in the uh, advanced stage of Parkinson's disease. So the challenges here will be basically the same and the recommendations again will be basically the same as for the subcutaneous apomorphine pump. Uh, another advanced uh, treatment option is, uh, is the levodopa or, or two different types of uh, levodopa yeyunal pump, one with levodopa carbidopa intestinal gel or duopa and the other one, levodopa, carbidopa, entacapon, intestinal gel, so uh, lessigon pump. Uh, what needs to be done in this case is a PEC, which you see this uh, feeding tube, uh, which goes through the abdominal wall into the stomach and through this bigger uh, tube, we insert a thinner jejunal tube, which goes into du the duodenum or the, the upper intestine and delivers the gel uh, with levodopa directly at the site where it's absorbed. In this way, we can uh, maintain the very stable and nice plasmatic levels of levodopa and manage much better the motor fluctuations. Nevertheless, again, this is an invasive therapy. So uh, some of patients may have problem with uh, the PEC insertions in the abdomen. And what we can generally see are either wound infections or formation of some excessive granulation tissue around the stoma or some uh, stoma leakage. Uh, probably the most common what we see are infections at the side of, of, uh, of uh, PEC insertion. And uh, here, uh, the main problem is not non-adequate hygiene and a uh, problem with uh, instructions that are given to patients. One of the most common problems you can see is here in this picture. So usually when I see patients who come with some infection of the pec stoma, the stopper, this uh, white triangle, which you see here quite loose, is not where it should be. It, uh, what we instruct the patients is that the stopper should be some half a centimeter, one centimeter away from the abdominal wall to prevent the pec tube going in and out of the abdomen. In this case, the tube is very loose and it may just travel in and out the abdomen and uh, bring in some, some uh, dirt from the outside. So this is, this is something that should be maintained very well. Uh, otherwise, uh, we, we tell the patients to clean uh, clean uh, the abdominal wall or the peg insertion site twice a day during the morning routine and evening routine when they uh, turn on and turn off the pump, uh, usually with some non-irritable uh, agents. So we don't like alcohol, we don't like iodine. So just clean water or some herbal solutions, maybe a little soap, but really nothing, uh, nothing very irritable. 
if some granulation tissue occurs, uh, this can be surgically removed. But usually what we see is that once granulation start appearing, it's probably this sort of uh, wound healing or type of patients where they will be coming uh, back very likely again uh, after some time. And the last problem which I will uh, cover are skin complications related to deep brain stimulation uh, therapy. Uh, and again, this is something from the outside, which is not uh, innate to the body. So what we tend to see, or very infrequently, again, in this case, luckily, are either hardware infections or skin erosions. So usually hardware infections uh, occur at the site of the implantable pulse generation uh, generator, like you see here in this case, uh, where patients may feel some pain, the area is a little bit reddish. So as soon as this uh, appears, they are instructed to contact us as soon as possible. If possible, and the infection doesn't look too bad, we try to uh, treat our patients with uh, antibiotics, usually IV, very aggressive therapy. If we think it's not safe, we explant the, uh, the neurostimulator, the battery, we explant the connection a cable uh, going uh, from the head to the to the battery, and always, if possible, we prefer to keep or we try to keep the electrodes in the brain as they are, if possible, of course, um, in order to uh, keep the therapy uh, sort of uh, uh, plausible for the future. Um, because the, I mean, the, the electrode insertion is probably the, is by far the most problematic part of the surgery, but to minimize the risk of infection getting into the brain. Uh, sometimes if patients don't uh, contact us, they don't manage well, uh, the infections may uh, go on and uh, change into some sort of skin erosions. Like in this case, this is of course, a reason to explain the stimulator immediately. And we are very unhappy to see this. I think I've seen something like this only once in my life and I hope I will never see it again. Okay, so um, that's all from my lecture today. And I thank you for your attention and I, I'm sure you recognize this site in Alberta. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sukarvanik. That was very good, very informative. I do have a few questions from the floor. If sure. an environmental testing has been done previously and it was inconclusive, would it be recommended to repeat it? And would there or would there be a better plan? Uh, so sorry, could could you maybe explain a bit better? What do you mean by environmental testing? that I don't know that's, that's what was written because yeah okay because I'm not sure what it relates to maybe if the person could expand a bit better whether what, what are we talking about because uh are we talking about um... I don't I don't have any yeah, actually, other information so yeah actually sorry because I don't understand the question whether whether we are talking about environmental testing of what I will try and get some further yeah, clarification okay, so, for that. Yeah, because okay, so in the meanwhile, maybe we can answer remaining questions. So uh I can see a question in the chat, so maybe I will just uh, go on and answer those in the meantime. So is livedo reticularis dangerous or is it cosmetic? As far as I know, again, I'm not a dermatologist, livedo reticularis is not very good, so uh, it should definitely be managed. So if, if you experience livedo reticularis after amantadine, it should be definitely discontinued. There is, there is no question about that. And I see a second question in the chat. Uh, young onset of Parkinson's disease and what is the definition? So we have uh, we have various different definitions based on uh, based on what we are looking for. So if we uh, there are basically two cutoffs. 
One cutoff which is more strict is, is onset at the age of 40 and before. Uh, a less strict cutoff is 50 years and before. So the cutoff of 40 years and less is important, especially for genetic testing, because uh, if Parkinson's disease starts before the age of 40, there is a very high chance of, uh, of uh, genetic background of Parkinson's disease. Uh, if we talk about onset before the age of 50, um, we still talk about a slightly different subtype of Parkinson's disease because uh, what we know is that if Parkinson's disease starts at a very young age, these patients tend to uh, progress in a slightly different way compared to patients who start in a very late age of Parkinson's disease. So in general, young onset patients uh, usually develop more motor fluctuations and more dyskinesia, and usually they develop them earlier than some patients who start late in life. Nevertheless, um, young onset patients tend to develop the levodopa resistant or non-responsive symptoms like uh, balance problems and, uh, and other cognitive problems much later. So it, it takes many, much, much more years and, and the longer disease course to develop this sort of more complicated symptoms. I have another question. How common are moles on your back or body? And is the appearance of new ones linked possibly to Parkinson's? Um, yeah, I think uh, this very much depends on the person and uh, the skin type. So people who are very pale uh, will probably have a different uh, prevalence compared to people who are dark skinned, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think there are many, many factors uh, based on that. We know that prevalence of moles is increasing with age, and I don't think there is any association or at least there is no known association between uh, increased prevalence of moles and Parkinson's disease. I don't think there is uh, anything uh, which could support this. I have another question. Where do bolus hemagoid lesions commonly appear? Usually, as far as I know, usually they appear in the limbs more common than the trunk. Another question, any change in collagen with facial masking? So, sorry, could you repeat? That one's in the chat. Any change in collagen with facial masking? Ah, yeah, okay. No, no, no. I, as, as far as I know, I don't think I have ever seen any paper that would um, talk about anything like that. I don't think actually there is anything going on with collagen because we know very well that if my patient is treated well with dopaminergic therapy, the facial masking uh, basically goes away and, and um, mimic functions are basically normal. So uh, I don't think there is actually much of a connection with collagen. And the meaning of prodromal stage, a prodromal stage is a stage before onset of typical motor symptoms. So you look at the patient, he looks like any regular person you will see on the street. No tremor, uh, moves normally, normal arm swing, etc., etc. But he already has Parkinson's disease, although there are no motor symptoms yet. Someone has asked, does sweating and edema occur at the same time? It's not a rule. Uh, usually, uh, edema is much less common compared to excessive sweating. Excessive sweating is a very, very common uh, problem in Parkinson's disease. Um, lower or uh, leg edemas usually are linked to side effects of dopaminergic medication in most patients if related to Parkinson's disease. So I think uh, the, me the mechanism is different. What is the incidence of melanoma in Parkinson's? Okay, so this is a tough question and I don't have an exact number for you, but it's low. 
I mean, it's it's increased compared to general population, but uh, it's relatively low anyway. So over the last 15 years, uh, I have seen only a couple of patients with Parkinson's disease and uh, malignant melanoma. So in my center, we follow about 1,000 uh, Parkinson's disease patients, and I've seen maybe three. So very low. Okay, I think you have your microphone off. Sorry. Moles that have been present for many years but are now becoming raised and irritated. When they flake or scrape off, then they heal and they come back again. Then the cycle repeats itself. Is this Parkinson's related? No, no, this is definitely not Parkinson's related. And in this case, you should definitely see a dermatologist to make sure that uh, these are truly moles because sometimes uh, uh, there are different conditions in the skin which may look like a mole but they are the different fibromas or some other things so I think if you have moles which uh, go off and come back I think this is something that the dermatologist should definitely consult. Okay, I have a little bit of clarification with that environmental question. Okay. Very good. <laughs> so they grew up in an area where there was potential mercury poisoning found in that area. And they had environmental testing done. Okay. Now wondering if it was inconclusive, if it should be repeated. Uh, testing of the environment or testing of Parkinson's disease or testing of the mercury, uh, whether it's still there. So may, maybe, okay, so maybe I, okay, let's, let's answer this uh, as, as we can. So uh, we know that uh, exposure to factors from the outside increases the likelihood of Parkinson's disease but the increase is not dramatic for most. So for example, uh, we have some areas where we had, uh, where we know there were some uh, increased exposure to either pesticides or to some uh, heavy metals like mercury, etc. And it doesn't mean that if you live in such an area, you will develop Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease or some other neurodegenerative disease but the likelihood is higher compared to people living in other places. And usually the increase in likelihood will be somewhere between one and a half and threefold. So uh, if you take that general population risk of Parkinson's disease at the age of 60 is 1%. So if you live in an area like that, your chance of having Parkinson's disease is maybe one and a half to two, three percent. So it's higher, but it doesn't mean that a neurodegenerative condition will actually appear. And it will depend on many other factors like your, like your genetics and other factors uh, in lifestyle. <laughs> 